Did oh, you do this? I did. Are you sure? Wait, Are you I sure you so. controlled all of your electronic devices? <laughs> well, hello, everybody. I believe we are live, and I believe you're here, and we're here, which makes it an awesome time. Thank you so much for being here. So happy that you're hanging out with us this fine Wednesday evening in the middle of April. Yes, now that we've got all that straight, <laughs> you know what time it is, and you know what day it is and what month it is. Thank goodness I was here. I'm like a basically wow. a, a, a calendar over here. Sure. So glad you're hanging out with us tonight. Thank you so much. We've got a few things going on. One, yes, we do. We do have a giveaway. Actually, we have a, a two-part giveaway, in fact, happening later this evening. And we have a topic that we're going to be talking about this evening as well. And so I hope you're looking forward to that because I know we are. And we've got all kinds of things going on. So I'm glad you're here as we get really deep into the spring fish keeping season. You know, I, it's it's kind of fun, although not so much today because and, and before <laughs> I forget, before I forget, I hope that doesn't happen. But it was extremely, extremely and it still is very windy in these parts. And I don't know if that I'm 94 percent sure. That's probably what has been playing a little bit of havoc on our internet today. It's gone down a couple times. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we don't get any blips. But at least two times, from what I can remember, I was like, oh, man, what happened to the internet? So, But it's it's been really windy. So I'm hoping that the wind is kind of chilled out a little bit and the internet is like, I got this, bro, and everything's going to be all right. So... I know as other people have been saying, oh my gosh, like new friends, it's been super windy here. We have a tornado watch and power blips. Wow, that's oh makes for an exciting evening, right? Head Love to the basement like all the, yeah, and the, hang out. Well, at least if that happened here, we'd already be in the proper location. Right. Although I don't ever actually do that. So no. usually what happens when we have severe storms around here, the family and the dogs all go into the basement, which is this. And I stay upstairs Normal. looking out the window. I've done that ever since I was a kid. I think it's because my dad used to do that. And I have been able to see two tornadoes doing that. Now, one was a little scary. And it, I remember it. Don't worry, we're going to get talking into fish, but now that I'm on the subject. It was the middle of summer, and my dad was talking to my friend's dad. And we were about halfway down the block from where we live. And me and my brother and my, my friend and his little brother were out playing. And all of a sudden, my dad looks up, and it was, it was getting really dark. And he's like what is that <laughs> and it was a funnel cloud and it was just like going psh, right across the sky and all of a sudden it got really orange and it got really super windy and it started like raining sideways and so i rode my bike like my dad's like get home and so i was booking because that's what you did in the 80s you booked this might have even been late 70s so i was booking home on my bike and the, i kind of got blown somewhat off my bike into the driveway so i just left it there and then i'm pounding on the door the door's locked i'm pounding on the door my mom is home and she was already in the basement under the pool oh. table because that's where you went when we were kids is you went in the basement under the pool table. Oh. So she had to come running back upstairs. I'm pounding my over the door. And all of a sudden I see my dad and he's got my brother under one arm because he was pretty small at the time and his big wheel in the other arm. And he threw the big wheel down and finally we got in and we all hid under the pool table and nobody blew away. But after that fact, there was an, uh, just like a regular above ground pool that had been blown out of somebody's backyard. It was on the street. Uh, another person like across the way, their their roof was blown off. So it was like serious. That was a serious thing. And I've also seen one other one. So yeah, I, I just felt like I needed to share, open up the live stream, sharing that wonderful story with you. Sorry about that. But that's, yeah, I've seen them. I've seen See, them with my own two eyes. Now my dad was a plastics engineer. So when we went down the basement, we hid under the drafting tables. That is not nearly as good as the pool table because that pool table is super heavy duty. It's got like that big slate. Have you ever seen a drafting table? Yes, I've seen a drafting table. Yeah, but we also had things that we could like kind of reach up and like grab like his pencils and his erasers and stuff. And, oh, good, because you know, that's what you want is a bunch of sharp pencils when things are blowing around really fast. In the basement. <laughs> Just need so, stuff to do. I guess. I mean, sure. That, I, I guess that's a good idea. Uh, so anyway, videos, things that have come out this fine week so far. On Sunday, I did a species profile of the thread fin rainbow. And if you haven't seen that, cool. check it out because the thread fin rainbow, it's a little guy. It's not like the normal size rainbow. I know some of you have an aversion to rainbow fish because they have a tiny little head relative to their large bodies. I personally like them, but I know not everybody does. 
but the thread fin rainbow is not like those rainbows they stay small and they've got insane looking fins so if you haven't seen that video yet check it out thread fin rainbow species profile that we did uh, or that i did on sunday and then on the tank talk podcast the other channel that we do uh, john from kg tropicals and i do uh, we did basically it was it was a really interesting subject and one i had a lot of fun talking about it was the path that your fish take to from where they're born to your aquarium and i think unless you've kind of been in that part of the industry sometimes people don't realize just all the different places that your fish can come from and the traveling that they do and i promise you there's a lot of fish most likely that are in your tanks that have traveled further and their tiny little lives than you will travel in your entire life so check that one out the tank talk podcast what is so funny why are you giving me that look because oink says uh yeah back in the 80s your boy jason was booking <laughs> that's right i was <laughs> yeah i was booking and uh thank you very much crystal and uh, michelle and new friends thank you very much okay so yeah that was monday your video today on the small scape what did you talk about i talked about when you have tiny tanks you need a tiny cleanup crew that's what I talked about. So you've got tiny tank cleanup crew options on the small scape from today. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the members video on this channel. And then of course we'll have our regular scheduled video on Sunday out as well. And so that's the land of videos. In terms of where we are going to be, this Saturday is the last swap that we're gonna do for a couple months. And that is the Greenwater Aquarius Society swap in Tinley Park, Illinois. Super that fun. is Saturday the 20th and it goes from uh, 10 a.m. until 1, I believe. I 1 think so. So it's free to get in. Uh, you don't have to be a member. Uh, thank you to everybody who's already placed your pre-orders because that is awesome. And that is the way you guarantee that the fish you want will be there. I always tell people, if you are interested in the fish we have, do the pre-order. Trust me, uh, it's just going to make your life a lot easier. You don't have to worry about, oh, are you sold out? It happens every single time that we do these swaps. Someone comes in like, oh, I really I wanted those. I'm like, well, pre-order next time they'll be there waiting for you so that's what's going on uh, this saturday and then the next thing is big, big. because it's aquashella it's time aquashella dallas is coming up in a month it's hard to believe but basically four weeks from this weekend actually slightly less it is going to be aquashella dallas time and they are rolling out this there's a lot of great speakers i am not as far as i know scheduled to speak it's the first time in quite a few aquashellas that I am not scheduled to speak, which I'm fine either way. If I speak, that's great. If I don't, it just allows me to spend more time with you, which I'm perfectly happy doing. So, but there's a lot of good ones. Brett Rayner is scheduled to speak. Mm, Tanner Serpa Design back. is scheduled I to speak. Uh, cool. Let's see, there's a couple others. I was like, wow, that's really cool. But they've got a pretty solid speaker lineup. So uh, definitely worth checking it out. And if you're planning to go, may I make a suggestion? Do the VIP tickets. It's just, especially if you're planning to go both days, it's gonna make life so much easier. Those lines getting into Aquashella, they're just gonna be long, right? When you've got thousands of people trying to get into that venue, it's just, it creates long lines. So the VIP, what it does is the VIPs get in at 10 a.m. and that allows you to beat the rush because I believe, and I always screw these times up, I don't know exactly, but I'm, I'm sure, pretty sure it's 10 a.m. for the VIPs. 11 a.m. for early bird, and I wanna say it's like noon for general admission, but by the time you're in that like 11 to noon range, that's when you often see like the videos where the people are standing in a line that's a quarter mile long. So that's why the VIP thing tends to be the way to go. And then you can get in both days, both Saturday and Sunday, get in a little bit earlier, do the meet and greet stuff. So that is, that's the biggest Good bang time. for your buck. And I think they still do. Don't quote me on this, but I, I don't know if they still do the merch, um, like the T-shirt. They used to just give the T-shirts away, but I to the to the VIPs. But now I think they just give a like a merch credit, mm. so people can kind of get their their own thing. It doesn't have to be that particular shirt. So that is what is happening. And again, that is May eighteenth and nineteenth. So yeah, it's coming up in almost exactly a month because tomorrow is going to be April eighteenth. So one mm, month away. Very good. Yeah, I know. I can do. All, I, I'm just like man, I am killing it today on the whole calendars, days, and times. You're on. Uh, I am, yeah, I'm on my game. And uh, thank you to Second Floor. And uh, did you know that Ryan 
just missed my birthday. Really? His is on the 14th. Wow, that's exciting. Yep. Happy belated birthday, Ryan. Very cool. Yeah, and so you were gone last week, so you didn't get I to was. see any of the... I was jazzing. Yeah, you were at the... You were... Did you have anybody play the jazz flute? What movie? Yes. Lunch? What movie? We need you to play the jazz flute. Yes, because well, I, I sent I, you a clip. I sent you yeah, a clip. I think oh. I already did that movie quote last week, though, now that I think about it, so... Uh, You're going to yeah. be doing that every week, huh? I guess so, for the rest of my life. So like, all right, <laughs> seriously, can we get over that? Do something different. Uh, so anyway, we like I said, we do have a giveaway coming up a little bit later. And we are going to be talking about invertebrates. Invertebrates? 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 So we're going to be talking about that today. Yay. And I think, thank you, the fish dude, anchor man. Yep, that is true. You play flute? You play jazz flute? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so. Thank you. Invertebrates, that is our subject for the evening. For the most part, when it comes to freshwater invertebrates, we're mostly talking about snails and shrimp, right? Because, I mean, there's a few others. Uh, we've had, what was the little bitty guy that, um, the little one that you had in that little tiny quarter gallon tank already people oh are my like, quarter gosh. gallon tank. Micro crabs. Oh, the micro tie crabs. Yeah. Yes, yes. Those were extremely small. Tiny. You've also got like the crayfish, the dwarf crayfish. We've had regular crayfish in our tanks before, which were actually pretty cool until our Oscars got big enough to consider them food. I didn't get them out in time and I'm like, oh man, there goes our crayfish. So anyway, yeah. you've got some options when it comes to invertebrates. And I think the reason I want to spend a little bit of time tonight talking about them because they're cool. You know, we get used to seeing fish swimming around a tank and we don't always appreciate that there are other organisms. And believe me, if you've never kept shrimp or snails in your life and you're like, that sounds boring. They don't do much. They don't swim around like fish do. Trust me, the first time you ever put them in a tank, you will find yourself watching them. <laughs> That's right. Probably obsessively because they have a very different personality. Like, it's like, where's the snails now? What are they doing? And you can actually see them moving around and the shrimp are doing their whole little picking at stuff. It's a lot of fun. So snails, if we'll start there, I think we can start with the snails, right? If we sure. want. So for invertebrates, what, why would one keep snails? Besides that they're kind of cute? Besides that they're kind of cute. Yeah, and they, they and offer they that different look. Come in different colors. They come in different colors. Good point. So you can you can add different colors to your aquarium without having to worry about different color fish. So I'm curious because all right, when it comes to snails, let's just kind of lay out the foundation here. The two most popular are going to be mystery snails and the nearite snails. There are other types, but most of those other types are cons what most people would consider to be pest snails. So like your Malaysian trumpet snails, your you know your pond snails, your ram's horn snails, a lot of people would say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I don't know about all those other ones, but the mystery snails and the nearites, I think most people often will buy those on purpose. The other ones just usually hitch a ride with some aquatic plants or you get some new fish. And the next thing you know, you're like, what the heck is going on in here? What's crawling around on my glass? Little tiny pebbles. <laughs> those are your snails. So Congratulations. I think for the most part, Let's stick with the mysteries and the nearites. Do you have a favorite? If you had to pick one. Mysteries. The, I didn't even finish my I sentence. know, right? Okay, fine. Mysteries. Yeah. Why? Why is it that you are a mystery snail fan? Because the magentas are the best and they go with my favorite fish, the green neon. Anything else? And you've done that before, right? I so have. you had that 20 gallon with the magenta mystery snails. So we combo. started breeding those. We had those breeding for a while in that tank. Uh, yeah, and they, they were with the green neons. That was pretty cool. Uh, mystery snails definitely have a lot of awesome colors. So the magenta, that might be my favorite color variety as well because they, they're they purple mystery snails. And I thought yours... There is purple, but the magentas, I think, are even cooler than the purples. No, the magentas are basically purple. Oh, but there's although, purple. No, no. Okay, all right. I all think right, they right. do come in... Yeah. They're labeled two different kinds. The magentas, did they have like the what I like to call like the blonde body, the yellow body? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, I thought they were too. Okay, where the purples might have often more they of a might. darker body. Mm -hmm. So lots of different color varieties. You've got the magentas, you have the blue mystery snails, which I like those a lot. Cool too. You have the gold mystery snails. We bred those things by, I don't even know, thousands of them at one point. Uh, there are the ivory mystery snails, which are pretty cool. And then you've got, of course, the algae covered mystery snails, which sometimes yeah. happen. People ask that all the time, like, my mystery snails are covered with algae. What should I do? Hmm, not much, just let it be because what are you gonna do about it? Just 
you know, especially it's especially funny when the mystery snails get the little hair, like yeah. the, the green hair, the, like the green algae like starts to grow a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, it's like hey, I got myself a hairdo now. I'm a shell. Or their little winter coat. So mystery snails, lots of different colors. However, I really don't think you can overlook the nearite snail in terms of colors either. No, that's they are pretty cool. Because I, I do have to say they are very cool. And not only that, not only can you get the nearite snails in different colors. And by the way, let me show you what we're talking about here because I just realized I, was, I didn't have my little video up. So this is a tank where we had our, our gold mystery snail breeding tank. There were a lot. This is a 20 gallon. There were lots. Oh, they eat plants. Take a look at the tank. Not usually. All right. So they don't typically eat. I want to say, say that from the start. They don't typically eat plants that are healthy. And we had them in a planted tank for a long time here you look at the nearite snail nearite snails are really cool because they've got that pattern right so the mystery snails generally are going to be more solid colors where the nearites are going to have like stripes and spots and all kinds of interesting patterns on their shells they also tend to stay a little bit smaller which is nice so for those who have smaller aquariums that can be a big advantage now for the snails what would you say in terms of a minimum tank size Oh gosh, we've kept uh, two and a half. Oh, for of, sure. A mystery snail. Yeah. The, the only problem that you're going to have is that they might get out if yeah, you don't have a lid. So absolutely, yeah, and that doesn't matter what size tank. I mean, if you don't have a lid mm -hmm. in your aquarium, sometimes they will tend to not tend to, but they they can possibly get out. Uh, but I could see keeping a, a near or two or three in a one gallon without any issues. Again, now mm -hmm. I want to be careful here because I'm assuming that if you're keeping a small volume of water, like a one gallon tank, you've got some fish keeping experience. You know how to keep those water parameters stable. But you're talking about an inhabitant that's got a very low energy level. It's not like you're having to worry about swimming space like you do with fish. So people ask all the time, hey, I've got a one gallon tank. What can I do with it? I often say, well, there's I really don't have any fish you could put in there but maybe a mystery snail or maybe a few nearite snails might look kind of cool. Or for some people who've grown their ram's horn snails, I don't want to overlook those because the ram's horn snails are pretty awesome too. And they can be pretty uh, decently large, like maybe dime size, nickel size. And they've got that cool ram's horn pattern that I would give it the name. So that's kind of nice. So you can keep them in smaller tanks. The other big advantage with the snails is of course, algae control. So they're going to be eating algae on the on the glass. They're going to be eating algae on your rocks and your wood. And so for those of you who have smaller aquariums where you can't fit some of the larger, you know, like a bristlenose pleco or something like that, or you don't have a large enough aquarium to put a whole school of otos, then the mystery snails, the nearite snails might be the answer. Now I will say when it comes to the nearite snail, there is a downside. Do you remember what the downside is to the nearite snail? Yes. Eggs on your glass. Eggs on the glass, eggs on your rocks, eggs on driftwood and on plants. They leave these little tiny hard white eggs everywhere. Now the interesting thing about both of these snails is they, neither one of them, let me rephrase. Both of them are very easy to control with their breeding. The nearite snails are not gonna breed in pure fresh water, which is cool. And the mystery snails, you're gonna know if they breed because they're gonna leave a big, huge egg clutch somewhere above the water line, which if you don't wanna have a bunch of mystery snail babies, no problem. Just take that egg clutch out and then don't worry about it. So uh, that's, I mean, that's a pretty easy way to do that. Now, it is kind of annoying. And I see this question pop up all the time on, the internet. Hey, I've got all these little hard white things everywhere. Is it, is it a disease? Are these parasites? And it winds up, one of the questions that we'll ask is, well, do you have a nearite snail in your tank? Yep, well, that's probably the eggs. I don't remember, and Jose is actually absolutely right. Nearite snail uh, eggs look like little white sesame seeds. That's exactly what they look like. Question for all of you, because I don't remember any fish ever eating those eggs. Like I've, in I every wondering. tank I've ever had nearite snails, I remember having to scrape those things, at least off the glass and stuff. But I've like also- a pleco? No, pleco yeah, shrimp? I don't know if I've had- Mono shrimp. We're not gonna eat a mono shrimp. Just gonna chow down on some nearite snail eggs. No, they'll just remove them, put them in a pile and put them in the garbage for you. Maybe, yes. Because they're so awesome. Maybe that's what they would do. Yeah. But I don't remember any fish eating those things. But then again, I don't remember having bristlenose plecos in a tank where I had nearite snails. 
Mm -hmm. if you want a challenge, you could breed the nearite snails in, I believe it's, yeah, brackish water. So if you, if you had a brackish water tank set up, they would breed there. So uh, Christy said that uh, her quarries eats them. Great. So, and maybe I just didn't, did I not have nearite snails in with quarries? Quite possibly I didn't. So, uh, but yeah, they're both really great options for smaller tanks. They are great options for eating algae. They're not going to eat all types of algae. Like, so for instance, if you've got like a bunch of green hair algae growing, maybe not the best for that. There are other things that you can do. They're relatively cheap. That's the other cool thing. They're relatively easy to get. They're fairly common. I have found them to be mostly hardy. They do a little bit better in harder water. I think that's why they thrive in our environments because you've got that harder water with a higher pH and you've got all the, the calcium that they need. And by the way, if you need snail food, uh, Flip Aquatics sells it. Uh, I think they have the Cats Aquatics snail food, which is really good. We've used that a number of times. They're these little calcium chips that also give them other nutrients that they need. The nice thing about those foods is they don't break down in the water quite as much as some of the other foods do, but they're relatively easy to feed. They're scavengers. When you drop pellets into the, you know, into the tank, any sinking pellets, you're going to see them. They're going to go right for them. So not very hard to feed, but especially if you have a little bit softer water, you're going to want to feed them those calcium infu infused uh, invertebrate types of foods because that's going to help keep their snail shells nice and strong. Otherwise, what will happen is they start to get discolored, turn white, get really thin, and then you find your snails no longer with you anymore. So uh, uh, new friends said as well, let's see, uh, my bristles, plecos, chow down on the snail calcium food, K uh, KG cells, yeah as do the other snails. Oh yeah, bristlenose plecos, plecos in general. They're like, yeah, that's cool, man. We can do that too. I uh, did want to say a big giant thank you because yep, here we've got DeMars gifted another 10 primetime aquatics memberships. We've got 10 new prime timers so because nice. of you. Thank you so much for that. Really, really appreciate it when you do that. Uh, always very kind. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So that is, I think, just a general overview on snails. Again, they're really easy to keep. It's not like you have to worry about aggression or anything like that, or they're not gonna go after your fish. Well, they will eat dead and dying fish. So if you've got fish that are laying at the bottom of the tank and they're no longer with you, they'll take care of that for you. And people ask that question all the time too, was, hey, I had some, I, I don't have as many fish as I used to. <laughs> Especially if they're smaller, you know, like neon size, rasboras, you probably aren't gonna see them. I can tell you right now, somebody asked this question, I think, I don't remember if it was last week during a live stream or if it was in a comments section somewhere on either Tank Talk podcast or here. Do I worry about dead fish in the aquarium? Yes and no. If it's a large fish, yeah, I make sure if I notice, a, well, if I notice fish that are dead in the aquarium, I generally remove that. But if they're in our aquariums, keep in mind, in anything 20 gallons or above, we have bristles, plecos in all those tanks. We have snails in some of our tanks, especially the Malaysian trumpet snails, and some a uh, couple tanks have ram's horn snails, but we have a lot of scavenger fish. And so a lot of small fish that are no longer with us, that decease in, in their tanks, we I never pull them and I never see them. Uh, I might notice, hey, there's a few less fish in a particular tank than there used to be. But even in some of the tanks, like for instance, in one of the 125s, we have what, maybe eight bristlenose plecos. And even if a decent size three or four inch fish dies, I might wake up the next morning and just see nothing but bones. So they can take care of, the snails in general can take care of fish and dead things pretty quick. Yep. Do you have a least favorite type of snail? Just. You know I do. Share, you wanna share with the class? Mil the Malaysian trumpet snails. Malaysian trumpet snails. <laughs> Boo. Yeah, I would say that those can be the most invasive. I know some of you who have had pet, what we call pest snails. Again, that's your bladder snails, pond snail, uh, ram's horn snail, and then the Malaysian trumpet snails especially. Those typically just hitch a ride, and then if you have a lot of food in the tank, they start to grow out of control, and yes. they can look maybe not so great when they're in high populations. The, the Malaysian trumpet snail to me, and I'm sure for many of you as well, is probably the hardest to control, the hardest to get rid of. They, I've told this story a million times, they will survive in a five gallon bucket that we put in a garage for over a year where I didn't even know Creepy. if there was any water in there, but they were in a substrate. You pull that stuff out, you dump it out, all of a sudden you got Malaysian trumpet snails still moving around in there. 
I am pretty sure when the world ends, you'll have cockroaches and Malaysian trumpet snails that will be there uh, taking over the new world because those guys are, they're really, really hardy. If there's one thing I don't mind about them, if you have sand, when you turn the lights on, often they will burrow. And what's interesting is if you look really closely, they will stick up little, um, they'll have little parts that stick up above the, the surface of the substrate. Yeah, for, for gas exchange. It's kind of cool. So I noticed that in the bristlenose pleco tank one time because that's usually where a lot of people have problems with snails is they're breeding bristlenose plecos. And when they put the food at the bottom, if the plecos don't get to them and there's some snails in there, they start to grow out of control. It's really hard to control it at that point. So big important thing there is if you're breeding fish that are going to be getting food from the bottom of the tank, do sand and not gravel. That way there's not as much food caught up and the fish have a bigger chance of eating the food. So yeah, Malaysian trumpet snails, definitely the hardest to control out of those three. But the snails, that's not the only thing. Uh, we also have, we've got the shrimp. Shrimp are awesome. Lots and lots and lots of different type. I am not a shrimp expert. We have kept, I feel like I do pretty well with the Neocaridina, Caridina, however you'd like to pronounce it. I love those shrimp. We've had, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, we've had pretty much every color variety that there is. The video I'm showing you is some of our, our, our cherry shrimp. There's some browns mixed in here because I generally, I would remove the browns just to kind of, as best I could, keep the shrimp as red as possible. Them, But I never purposely like got rid of the brown shrimp. They would just wind up in other tanks where I didn't care if they bred and they would most likely survive. But the the, the shrimp are awesome. It's an, now, all right, so if you had to pick between shrimp and snails, you could only have one tank, what would it be? Shrimp. Okay, so if you could only pick one type of shrimp, what would yellow. it be? Yellow. Okay, so you like the yellows. And yes, unless unless I really I really needed them to to really, you know, keep the keep keep the tank really clean, then I'd have to do a monos. But yellows okay. are my favorites. Yeah, the yellows are really cool. So there's lots of different color varieties. And just like with the snails, if you're looking to add color to your aquarium, shrimp are a good option. All right. So here again, you're looking at some cherry shrimp. We've had blue, we've had blue dream, yellows, pumpkins, uh, like the pumpkins too. black rose, uh, the, uh, I don't know what they call the snowball. white. Snowball. 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 Thank you. Uh, we've had those as well. And we've even had some of the, the really shrimp, which are, I think they're the caradina, right? So Lots of different kinds. I like the Neos because they will accept a decent amount, a, a wide range of water parameters. That's one of the reasons why we don't do a lot with the Caridina Caridina because those typically are going to want water parameters that we cannot provide as easily without RO, where the Neos, we can do our GH and KH of 10, our pH of 8.2, and keep them a little bit warmer. The trade-off with shrimp, just to let you know, is the warmer you keep them, the, the shorter their lifespan, but the more they breed. So uh, in our fish room, because we basically heat this room and all the tanks are right around 78, that is definitely on the warmer side for shrimp. The nice thing about both the shrimp and the snails, if you don't have a heater, that's fine because they will easily go into the 60s. They live happily there. That is actually closer to their ideal temperature than where we keep them at in the upper 70s for sure uh, with the shrimp. But the other thing that's cool about the shrimp is they're really easy to breed, provided that you don't have fish in the tank that are going to eat the shrimplets. Now, for yeah. those of you who have seen the shrimplets, you know they are very, 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 tiny. very tiny. Yes, they're Super extremely tiny. tiny. And so the trick there is, okay, what fish can you put in a tank with shrimp? And now we did a video, it was called Shrimp Buddies, all right? So it's basically tank mates for your shrimp. And we did that also, by the way, there is species profiles for shrimp and snails in the description below. So if you wanna check that out, want more information on shrimp and snails, how to care for them, how to breed them, check out those videos. But we did a separate video, I forgot to link it in the description, and it was called Shrimp Buddies. And so some fish that you could keep with shrimp so that your shrimplets would be safe. There are fish out there that will be safe with adult shrimp, but they would definitely eat some of the shrimplets because they are so small. So you have to be a little bit careful there, but shrimp can be every bit as interesting as, as pretty much most fish. I mean, they are more active than snails will be. These are the blue dream shrimp that we, we currently have. I'm looking at the 40 gallon breeder, the same tank that you're seeing here. We've had that 40 gallon breeder set up with blue dream shrimp for years. 
And what I love about that particular strain is they have maintained that awesome blue color. They really where have. Where a lot of the other neos that we've had, if you're not really careful of culling the, the shrimp that are more clear or brown, they start to all kind of devolve back into their brown natural color form. These don't do that. At least ours haven't. They've always stayed a nice, deep, beautiful blue. So that's kind of cool. Tank size? What do you think? Tiny. Yeah, I mean, again, assuming that you really have a handle on keeping stable water parameters in smaller tanks, a one gallon is a, is a no-brainer for these guys. You could put a half a dozen in there. Are you gonna be able to breed like crazy? No, not in a tiny tank like that. Are you gonna have to potentially remove shrimp if they do breed in there? Maybe, but certainly if you've got a two and a half gallon or a five gallon, that's a great size. The big thing I think with both the shrimp and the snails is be careful with your filtration. Oh, because yeah. if you've got an intake that is really sucking water through and the intake is got large holes, they could sh easily, easily sh suck up your shrimplets. Uh, baby snails get sucked up. The big problem even with adult snails is sometimes the foot of the snail, which is the, the body, uh, it will get caught in the intakes of filters. I've had that happen, especially for those of you who are running the aqua clears because those aqua clears tend to have much larger holes in the intake, which is usually fine, but shrimp, I'm sorry, the snails very often get caught up in there. So an intake sponge works wonders, solves that problem for your hang on back filters and your canister filters. Sponge filters, as you're seeing in these videos, work out wonderfully because that gives some surface area for the shrimp to graze on as well, which is pretty cool. So a lot of options there. And again, the neos are really easy to breed and they're exciting, right? It's exciting to see those guys breeding. You mentioned the Amano shrimp. Yes. And what, what do they do that, what do they do better than most shrimp work they they go to work like an architect um, you're welcome yeah thank you go to work like a boxer so the amanos are absolutely awesome at eating green hair algae so that is one of the things that they do very well the other shrimp will do that they just don't do it as well i remember when we brought in large quantities of amano shrimp and we had them in a 10 gallon tank I would throw in big, at that time I had tanks that had a lot of green hair algae. I would throw that stuff in like a big clump of it, like baseball size. And because there were so many amano shrimp in those 10 gallons, they would have it polished off within three or four days. It was crazy. I threw in Java moss that was covered. You almost couldn't tell what's Java moss and what is green hair algae. After about three or four days, they had cleaned it all off. I had just pure Java moss left. It was awesome. You got a couple of comments here. I do. One's from uh, Michelle. Um, member for six months. What? Congratulations. Yeah, uh, she says, uh, would the red tail botia or yo yo loach eat the large mystery or nearite snails? 100%. <gasps> oh, yes. <gasps> Bye -bye. Uh, yeah, because yeah, yo yos and the, and the red tail botia get larger. So, uh, generally speaking, there's a couple things when it comes to, especially the snails. I don't trust any loaches around snails, and I don't trust any cichlids around snails or shrimp. Again, sometimes some cichlids will leave some of the larger snails alone. We've had that happen in our fish room, so it's not a hard and fast rule, but almost all cichlids, even small ones, will eat shrimp and even try to eat the adult shrimp. So I trust no cichlids around shrimp whatsoever. And again, it's a little bit tricky in terms of your, your stocking for, for the shrimp, for sure. And then you got a super chat. I do. Lady yes. 10? Yes. Thank you so much. Thoughts on water shells for calcium uh, for shrimp? Yep. People use them. We have not. I don't think we've used the wonder shells people do people like it i cannot speak from personal experience but it is a common thing that will that people use to add the calcium i personally however really prefer to have the that cats aquatics snail and we're not sponsored by cats aquatics or anything like anything like that i just think that they have a really solid food for invertebrates but i love that stuff those little chips again they weren't they her selling point was, hey, these aren't going to break down and cloud up your water like other types of calcium infused foods do. And sure enough, when I tried it and I, I had a whole mess loads of it, I, that was when we were breeding all kinds of, of shrimp and snails in our fish room. And I would drop that stuff in every day and it never did any bad things to our water. And the shrimp and the snails were not only getting the calcium, ingesting the calcium that they needed, but they were getting the other nutrients that they needed as well. So that's why... I was a big fan and still to this day am. We've still got some of that stuff, but we don't breed snails like we used to. And we've only got the one 40 gallon breeder uh, for the shrimp. 
Lisa's here. Roots and Whiskers. What's up? What's up? She says snail's heart. Snail's heart. She does like okay. snails. That's good. Uh, even like the big giant ones that you can hold in your hand, like the garden snails, those ones are a little creepy. I'm not going to lie. Do you want to know that I have never seen a land snail? Ever. Really? I just can't even I, picture it, except for like when Gary. We were kids well, Gary was not a land snail. We were always at the creek and there were snails there. I never thought really? to bring them home, though. It was never something I wanted to like, do. What's a typical size? I know you. No, like, these weren't. These were not right. very big. They were That's maybe I mean. that big. Like the size of a mystery snail. Yeah, probably. Really? Yeah, yeah. For some reason, that kind of grosses me out. I don't know why. Well, I can't. I, I, I can see that. I can see why that would gross you out. But hey, you know. Someday I'll have to see a land snail. Someday you'll have to see a land snail. I'll Hopefully, get you one when of those I'm planning big, giant on it. <laughs> baseball size ones. Yeah. Oh. Yep. No, I don't think so. You don't mm -mm. think so? Mm -mm. So anyway, yeah, those are two of the most popular invertebrates. Absolutely love them because they do great things. They're going to help do that little cleanup crew. They do eat on. They will eat uneaten food that falls to the bottom. They don't eat fish waste. In fact, snails will make waste just like the plecos do. So be prepared for that. But but what I always say is for people who say, oh, well, all plecos and snails do is just produce a bunch of waste. True. However, they're taking care of your algae and they're consuming a lot more algae than they are producing waste because a lot of the algae they're consuming are nutrients that have to go to building their bodies and, reprodu and reproduction and stuff. So it's a trade-off. You're getting a lot of food control and algae control, and yes, you're getting some waste, but not as much as the food that would have been there without them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, Ellison Dalton says, broke my wrist on Monday and having mm. surgery tomorrow morning. Well, I'm oh. sorry that that happened. That's no good. Oh. Th that's not... Good luck. Yeah. Prayers for healing. Th uh -huh. oh. Not cool. No, that is not, especially if it's your dominant hand. Oof. Yeah. That's the worst. I mean, and you know all about that with yes. your, your. Yep, I just not quite got broken uh, hand, but yeah, that that was uh, six months of fun. Yep. Um, time check. Okay, yeah, we got to do a giveaway, All right? We got to do a giveaway because Joanna's got to get going here pretty soon. But before Yippee! we do, I uh, want to thank Matt Four Twenty Seven for becoming a prime timer. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And Alpha Fish, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Hello, I just had my first two fry of. Gold shell dwellers. So the gold ocelotus, I'm assuming. What kind of pH do you keep bamboo shrimp in? They are my dream shrimp. So we have bamboo shrimp here, and we keep them in the same water parameters as everything else. So our GH and KH are 10 degrees each, and our pH is somewhere around uh, 8 to 8.2. And we've had those. those I am so surprised. Like Those are the longest living shrimp we have ever had. They're still in the 40 breeder with our I'm looking over there. And they're always hanging out right next to like wherever there's a lot of water flow. And they just sit there and they're getting all the stuff out of the water column. But we've had those things for years at those water parameters and no issues. That's a, that's, they creep me out. I'm not going to lie. I've said that before. The bamboo <laughs> shrimp creep me out because they're like underwater cockroaches or underwater like centipedes or something. And they, unlike other shrimp, when you try to net them out, they'll try to crawl out of the net. They're crawling up your arm. You're freaking out trying to get them off of you into the water where they belong. It's a little freaky. It could that's just cute. be a me thing. You got a yep, already a new primetime partner. That's what I was just talking about before. Okay, great. Yeah. And okay. Yep. I just answered that too. You're way behind. Way okay. behind. Really? You are I'll way fish behind. fish aquariums. Super chat. Yeah, that was the, literally the one I just answered about the bamboo shrimp. Really? That's what got you started on that? Sorry, I was like reading, man. I cannot see, do two things at once. Could you imagine what our household is like when it's just normal? Uh, <laughs> interesting it's, conversations oh my gosh and then you get me and my sister oh, yeah not oh good. that's yeah that's a real good one especially <laughs> if i'm stuck in the middle like i just want to go i just want to just everybody leave me alone let me out okay so giveaway tonight we've got one person is going to win a whole mess load of things tonight because and it's actually coming from two of our channel sponsors which is pretty cool first one that i want to talk about we're going to go back to our our old uh mystery snails type of thing and Flip Aquatics has been kind enough that they are going to be giving away a five mystery snail pack to Fun. the winner of tonight's giveaway. And so you'll, it's a random mystery snail pack, I believe. You might get different colors in that, in that random pack. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we've got a group of them in our 125 right behind us over here. They are doing awesome. And by the way, 
if you if you don't win, I got a wonderful surprise for you. In the description of this video, there is a code. I believe it's Prime Time Snails. It's in the description. <laughs> Prime Time Snails, and you can get twenty percent off all mystery snails and nearite snails for the rest of this week through Sunday at midnight. I believe that's when that code expires. So if you are interested in snails, if we're like, man, I really need some snails after this, flipaquatics.com. Their link is in the description. Use that code at checkout, primetime snails, and it's 20% off all of your mystery snails and nearite snails, which is pretty stinking awesome. So uh, the winner of tonight's uh, giveaway is going to get a five pack you're going to get a five pack of snails. That's what we do in fish keeping. But wait, oh, but wait, there's more. Uh, you're also going to get stuff from our other channel sponsor. And that is, it's all about liquids tonight, I've decided. <laughs> uh, liquids are awesome. And I, I think it's really interesting that I picked these liquids out because the first one you can't use with snails or shrimp. So just remember that. That's copper safe, but I love this stuff for ick. This is, it, it's a little bit harsher than ick x but if you've got a case of ick and you're like i gotta get rid of this and you don't have plants and invertebrates in your tank that's hugely important right do not put this in a tank with plants or invertebrates unless you want to see all those things go away because this has copper in it however it is a magnificent ick medication so copper safe this is i always have this on hand because of those times where the ick x is like man this is not i don't know if this is going to work this is the stuff. And the nice thing is you only have to dose this once. If you're not doing water changes, you put this in as directed, you leave it in, and it's stable over long periods of time. You don't have to keep redosing it. So this is good stuff. Do not use this with invertebrates or plants, or you will have problems. Uh, or scaleless fish, for that matter. Okay. Now, next thing. Let me interrupt. Before we do this, make sure that you, a lot of people are mentioning, go to all messages. Yeah. And it's if you're on the phone, there's a scissor and then there's some lines go into the lines and switch to all messages yep. instead of top messages okay continue. okay next thing is our standby our fritz time seven everybody should have this uh, we keep this in the refrigerator and it's awesome this is your live nitrifying bacteria so when you're setting up a new tank or you've had some kind of an ammonia spike this is the stuff that you want to add because this is going to add the living bacteria that is going to do that nitrification where you go from ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate. A big old bottle of this treats a lot of gallons. Definitely, this is something to always keep on hand. Fritz Zyme 7, awesome stuff. Uh, again, Fritz is a channel sponsor. They, and the reason why is because we've been using their stuff forever and absolutely love it. Way before we were ever uh, uh, partnered with them. And the last thing, of course, is the standby. Everybody needs water conditioner. This is the Fritz Complete, and this is going to get rid of your your stuff in the water, your chlorine, chloramines. Well, also, if you ever have an ammonia spike or nitrite, this will neutralize that as well. So uh, this is really, really good stuff as well. And by the way, if you're looking for that and you're going to go get your snails and shrimp from Flip Aquatics, they've got that too. So they should have that on hand. Now, here's the dealio. Uh, what we're going to be doing is, and again, you have to live in the United States in order to have all this stuff shipped to you, the 48 continental United States. Uh, what we're going to do is the first person to pick a number between 10 and 20 go uh, the first person between 10 and 20 who gets it right is going to be the person 10 and 20 between 10 and 20 I done done We're, yeah already done we are done there is no more need oh. to be typing in numbers because somebody already got the number correct it happened very very quickly mm -hmm. hold on a second let me scroll we got many screens because we so we got that yep i've got two screens that agree do you have a screen that agrees as well with with this yes okay so our winner of all of this stuff is anthony junker anthony you picked number 13 all of our screens are in agreement so anthony congratulations what you need to do to claim all of your winnings is you're going to send an email. And you're going to send that email to Prime Time Giveaway. Singular. Prime Time Giveaway at yahoo.com. Send us your mailing address. And sometime over the next week or so, Joanna will get all, well, she'll get this stuff boxed up. I will forward your information to Flip Aquatics so that they know. And you'll get all of these wonderful things. So you'll have meds, you'll have water conditioner and Fritzheim 7 and some brand new mystery snails. So 
Sweet. Big thank you to Flip Aquatics for doing that. Again, the discount code is in the description, so it's all is not lost, even if you're like, man, I didn't win again. Uh, don't worry. That code is there for 20% off your mystery or nearite snails for the rest of the week. Pretty awesome stuff. So you, I believe, are on your way out. In, which is not awesome. Yes. Which is not awesome. I must However, depart. Uh, oh, you wait, may depart, and I'm just going to scooch over. Don't worry. We've still got more to talk about, and I will. By the way, if you asked a question before all the numbers came popping through, it's gone. Uh, those questions are long gone because the chat will only go so far back. So if you ask the question and you would like it answered, it probably is now a good time to answer it again. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. You too. Now you can take a chair with you if you want, and I'll just keep on. I'll just keep on keeping on, just scooch it over. This is way easier to do now that we're in the fish gallery compared to when we were in the other fish thing, YouTube studio. So, all right, let me see here. Let me, uh, why is this thing still on like that? Let me get back to, there we go. All better now. Let me move my stuff over, fix my beard here because it's all messed up, apparently. That's what happens when you take a shower. It gets all frizzy. The humidity is just doing horrible things to my beard. See, some of you with hair think that I don't have to experience all of that. No, no. Humidity matters to me because then it's just my face puffs out instead of my head. I know. It's crazy, crazy but true. Danica and Aquatics, thank you so much for being a prime timer. Really appreciate it. That's pretty awesome. Glad you're hanging out with us. Very cool. All right, let me see. I saw some stuff. All right, let me see. You says, do you think the reward of tracking and managing micronutrients is worth the time invested? It can be. It just depends on what you are doing. I mean, if you've got a very high-tech planted tank, uh, certainly tracking micronutrients might be important to you. Uh, for us, it wouldn't be worth it because we have mostly low to medium light plants that are relatively easy. They don't need CO2. They don't need high light. So in that case, I have never found it necessary to track micros. Although, I don't know, maybe the plants would grow better if I did. Maybe that's uh, a, a blind spot in my fish keeping because I'm not really a, a super plant expert. I can keep them alive, as you can see behind us here. And as you've seen throughout the videos numerous times throughout the years. But I'm also, I would never consider myself to be a plant expert. Mr. Fish, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate you being here. And if you, I didn't see a question, but if you do eventually have a question, just type it below and I'll try to make sure that I, I get to it. All right, let me see. Asher's Art says, if my tap water comes out insanely hard, what would you recommend for doing water changes? Well, the only way that you can safely, in my opinion, soften the water for fish if it is insanely hard, as you're saying here, is an RO system. I know that there are you know, pH down and all this kind of stuff, but I really don't like the idea of trying to add chemicals to make the water a little bit softer. The, the, the way to do that is an RO unit. Uh, they can be a little bit uh, expensive, especially if you don't have the number of tanks to necessarily back it up. Like it would make a lot of sense if you've got five, 10 tanks, if you've got a 10 gallon and you're investing $200 on an RO unit, maybe it's not quite as, as uh, cost effective in that case, then you might just be going to the grocery store. And if you had like a small tank and just like, Hey, I'm gonna get some distilled water. Don't just use distilled water 100%. Over time, you'd want to add a little bit of that distilled water, or even if it's an RO unit, start adding it in slowly, and that will bring the water hardness down slowly. You don't want to shock your fish and have a big problem where you know, you've know you got a massive change in your GH and KH, and then also a massive change in your pH, because your fish are going to be like, yeah, I'm out, by. I'm like, oh, I just lost all my fish. Thought I was doing the right thing. Now, if you're keeping fish that like that harder water, don't do anything to it. Right? I mean, if your fish are doing fine in the water that you are providing them now, they're colorful, they're eating, they're active, they're, if they're you know, normally going to breathe in hardish water, and they are, then I wouldn't change it. But if you are thinking, hey, I'd like to keep fish that are going to enjoy, maybe you've got, I don't know, 15, 20 degrees on your water hardness, and you're like, I need to bring that, at least cut it in half. Well, then you can dilute some of your water, change water, and just slowly bring that down. And maybe you are at around an 8 to 10 degrees on both your GH and KH. But then you know how much distilled or RO water you have to add to get it there. Evan says collect some rainwater too. Yeah, that can work. Again, just be a little bit careful with the rainwater that when you are collecting it, it is not 
first going through a surface that could be picking up bird waste or something like that. But yeah, you could, we've talked about that before with rainwater. That is a possibility. Just have to be a little bit, a little bit careful. Madison said, I, I've started doing uh, RODI water for my tanks as well because my water is so hard. It's been awesome. Yeah, it can be great. I mean, it's a relatively straightforward way. Again, don't just use straight RO water because you're going to have no buffering capacity. You'll have no, uh, no uh, minerals in the water. Your fish will suffer tremendously. But I'm sure what Madison is doing and what a lot of people do is they start mixing it in in small amounts and slowly start bringing that hardness down because you do have to be really careful. You have to be careful as to, especially when it comes to KH, that's your carbonate hardness. That's your ability to buffer your, your pH, changes in pH. And if you lower that too much, next thing you know, you've got a crash in your pH and then you've got a lot of dead fish. So to avoid that, you bring that down slowly and then you can you can actually bring the water hardness down and not have a huge impact on ph so that that's the that's the ideal situation unless of course you need a ph that's more on the acidic side then you bring it down even more madison says my tank was 1400 parts per million i believe now i'm at 900 yeah that is almost uninhabitable right at that point i mean that's a lot right when i'm talking about our hard water we're at 10 degrees so that's less than 200 parts per million because, uh, by the way, fun fact, if you want to, because there's two different ways, right? I'm talking about degrees. Madison's talking about p parts per million. You're like, what does this all mean? You're not using the same the same measure, you know, the same units. For the most part, what it means is for every degree of water hardness, it doesn't matter if it's GH or KH, I believe it's 17, I, don't, well, I think it's like 17.85 parts per million for every one degree. So when I say I've got 10, then that's putting us right around 180 parts per million on both our GH and KH. And by the way, that is considered very hard water when we get to that high. So when you're talking about going to like a thousand, I mean, that's just off the charts, absolutely insane, right? So pretty crazy stuff. Uh, Joshua, thank you so much for becoming a prime timer. Really appreciate it. Hope you enjoy hanging out with all of these wonderful people that we have in our community. Emma, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Our TDS is over 300. So interesting that you bring that up because TDS stands for total dissolved solids. And that's a way that some people measure water hardness. I generally, when, when you hear me talking about water hardness, I almost never talk about TDS. And the reason for that is it's total dissolved solids, right? So that's going to measure GH, it's going to measure KH, it could measure nitrate concentrations in the water, it could measure other things, phosphates. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into TDS. And if you know, you can use TDS sometimes if you know what your GH and KH is normally. So if you were to test your water, and like just your tap water and say, okay, my tap water, let, let's just make the math easy. My tap water is 10 degrees on my GH and KH. So I know what that is. And when I test that, my TDA, TDS is X. And then if I test my tank water, my TDS is probably going to be more. That can kind of give you an indication of when it's time to do a water change at times. But yeah, I, I generally just use the, the test strips or even more often the, um, the liquid test kit. But once I do that once, I, I generally don't worry about it anymore because your, your TDS, I'm sorry, your GH and KH and pH usually aren't going to change, especially in my, I should, well, your GH and KH probably aren't going to change that much. Your pH could if your KH is low and ours isn't. So we have pretty stable water parameters here. New friend says, who doesn't love running those drop by drop KH and GH tests? Oh my gosh. I know so I get flack for this and I understand why, but I've always said, I much rather just use the test strips those you know six in one test strips i get it i understand that they're not going to be quite as accurate I, I i will concede that point but you can't argue the convenience of just get me in the ballpark that's what i'm looking for for most of these tests i just saw another facebook post the other day and it was probably somebody who was newer and i think they were running I don't remember what test they were running, but they're like, is this light blue? Is it dark blue? I can't tell. And I'm thinking it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What you're looking for is get me in the ballpark with all of these tests. You don't have to have it nailed down to the exact PPM or the exact number of degrees. If you're off by one or two degrees for our purposes in the aquarium hobby, so what? For freshwater fish keeping, who cares? It doesn't matter. You don't have to fret about 
making it perfect and trying to get it exact. What you want to do is you want to have a, a general range. And it's especially important for ammonia and nitrite. I mean, at that point, if, you, if you're registering ammonia or nitrite on your liquid test kits, there's probably something going on there. So does it really matter if it's one degree or, you know, or I'm sorry, one part per million or four parts per million? At that point, it's like, no, there's a problem here that I probably have to deal with. So, yeah, I don't stress. I don't stress too much about getting it exact. That's why I don't mind the, the test strips because I know I can use them and I know they're easy to read and convenient. Uh, Jared, thank you so much for the super chat. Can an angelfish in a 20 gallon be aggressive? An angelfish in any tank can be aggressive. They are cichlids, they can get territorial, but especially in a 20 gallon, I would say yes. Generally speaking, if I'm keeping angelfish, Long term, I want them in at least a 55 gallon, and the reason for that is they get they get very tall and they do get large if they're in a proper size tank. And when they do get larger, they do need some space. All right, they're going to need some space to kind of call their own. Sometimes they don't like other fish getting close to them as as they get larger. So yeah, I mean, you just never know. From one angelfish to the next, I've had angelfish that would that never even looked at another fish, big or small. Even some of the fish that maybe they could have eaten they just left alone and ignored but i've had angel fish that tried to terrorize everything else in the aquarium including severums and geophagus and electric blue acara these fish that would normally go to, together very well sometimes they can be a little rough on one another so just be a little careful there uh, black fire aquatics can i add two electric blue acaras and two angels in a 50 gallon again <laughs> just like i said maybe maybe not depends the only issue that you may have there is, do you know if your two angels are two females? Are they two males or are they a pair? Because there's only one combination that's probably, the, the best combination is if you wind up with two females, they tend to leave each other alone more than two full grown males. And once you get a pair, all bets are off if they start breeding. Same thing with the electric blue acara. In a 50 gallon, I would probably feel more comfortable long-term just having one of each one angelfish and one electric blue acara i'm not worried about breeding i'm not worried about in the off chance i wind up with two males that they're starting to get a little bit territorial and then what happens when your electric blue acaras let's just say you go you've got a pair for one and then you've got two males on the other one and now they don't have the space to spread out but normally, yes, normally those fish do get along fairly well. But again, with cichlids, you never know for sure. But I've had that combination numerous times. And I've, for the most part, never found electric blue acara, at least with the ways that I've kept them to be aggressive. They've always pretty much ignored other fish. And that particular combination has worked well for me. But I've also heard people be like, I, it didn't work. So but you will definitely be taking a chance with pairs in a 50. Now, if you just had the angelfish and they wound up being a pair, it's not usually the end of the world because it's a 50 gallons, a decent sized tank. And if they start laying eggs somewhere, they might chase other fish away from where they're, they're going to be, uh, the eggs are and where they're going to be hatching, but they're not generally overly aggressive to the point where they're wiping out all the other fish in the tank. Like for instance, if you had some, I don't know, Midas cichlids or red devil cichlids or Jack Dempsey's or green terrors and they bred, you put them in a 50 or even a 75 gallon and they breed, there's a chance they wipe out everything else in that tank. We had Midas cichlids breed in a 75. And if we had, we had anything else in that tank, I am 100% certain they would have absolutely wiped them out. It's just been relentless because even when I, when I went near the tank, they were attacking the glass, trying to attack me. And that's kind of crazy. I mean, they just didn't, they just don't care. I mean, a 10 inch male was like, I don't care that you're a grown human being. I am going to attack you because you're getting near my babies my hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of babies. Okay, let me see what do we got going on. Jennifer says test strips are easy. Therefore, I use them more often. Yep, that's kind of how I see it too. The test strips are just more convenient, not not necessarily more accurate. And you can very well make the case that, hey, if they're not going to be as accurate, that you don't want to use them. And that is a fair point for sure. Becky says, we used to go to a state park and would find land snails crawling on limestone rocks or along the trails, not too big, around an inch or so. Very cool. Slimy trail, though. Oh, yeah, for sure. I remember, I remember as a kid picking them up and stuff. You could, it's interesting because when I used to teach parasitology, we would talk about how snails, for some of the parasites, are an intermediate host. And that's kind of a, an interesting thing. It's funny. I haven't taught that class in parasitology. I haven't taught 
probably 12 years. So some of it starts to get a little foggy in my brain. I don't like that. I feel like I should teach that class again. I wish I could. Whip says, I have 12 to 14 electric blue cars and with three angels. And so far, there's little, there's a little chasing from time to time, but overall, no issues. Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of time, I've never had a problem with that combo. So that's cool. I'm, I'm assuming that that's probably a, a larger tank too with that many electric blue car or, or they'll eventually be moved to a larger tank because I had with the electric blue car when I did the species profile, I can't remember if I showed, I think I did show them. I had them in a 40 breeder. I had a pretty large group in a 40 breeder, probably eight to 10, and they were getting not 100% full grown, but getting there. It was actually a really striking look in a 40 breeder. And they were, they just weren't that aggressive. Even when they started breeding the, the pair that was in there, they would kind of chase the other fish around a little bit, but they didn't really do anything uh, to the other fish. They just kind of like, hey, get away from our babies. And their fish were like, okay, sorry, I got too close. And then I moved them to a 125 and they were fine there. Never had any issues. In fact, when I put them in that 125, they were in with the Viejas and Spilum, I believe, when they were younger. And that combination worked out really well. So overall, great fish. I don't have any in the fish room right now and it's been a while since... I mean, usually I've had them in the fish room pretty much nonstop. I think the last, I had a group that I got from somebody else, but the intent was to get them in and then bring them to the swaps, which I did, and then I sold them all right away, but awesome fish. Uh, let's see here. Jared, thank you so much for becoming a prime timer. Glad you're here. Very cool. Oink says, I had three Texas cichlids in a rescue group, and I never want anything that aggressive again. Yeah, it can be. They can, they can be a little bit tougher to manage for sure. Some of those South American cichlids, Central American cichlids can be, you, you just have to be willing to accept that sometimes they'll figure things out. In a large enough tank, they will absolutely figure things out, kind of like African cichlids do. Sometimes the way they figure things out can be a little bit more violent and a little bit more assertive than African cichlids. And... Sometimes the figuring it out doesn't work the way we like it to because they've figured themselves out of one less or two less inhabitants in a tank. And what's interesting about that, is I've always found, especially with the South and Central American cichlids, the more aggressive ones, is they can be fine for a long time. And then all of a sudden they're not. And when they're not, it only takes a couple hours for them to delete each other from the aquarium. So uh, it can be really tough. Mr. Fish says, did my question show up at all? I don't mind, but I'm just curious. No, it didn't. So go ahead and ask it again. Because when you left the super chat, I didn't see a question. So, and I see my Kehoe cichlid says, hi, that's cool. Let me, I'm just going to scroll up here and see if I see one, but I didn't. Hold on. I'm still looking. Oh, no. Uh, I'm still looking. I'm still looking. I don't see it. So maybe ask the question again, because I see you responding to others. Ah, here, here, here we go. Nope, I found it, I think. What was the weirdest fish combination you've ever kept or seen for me? It was goldfish and rams. That's kind of weird because they're not normally kept together. I have done a million very, very, very strange combinations. Most recently, we have a... Our bottom 125 in the fish room is right now serving, and I guess it always has somewhat served as a catch-all tank where I put fish that are moving from other aquariums. And I, before I do it, I, I understand the personalities of the fish, so I have a pretty good idea going into it how things are going to work. But at one point, that tank that I'm talking about had an 18.5-inch Nile tilapia, which was a massive, massive fish. His name was Timmy. It had Chaz, our 12-inch Oscar, and then I had a bunch of African peacock cichlids, mostly OBs and some red emperors. And I think there were some dragon blood, some Eureka reds. And right off the bat, people are probably like, holy cow, that's a no-no. Well, what was interesting about that tank is it was one of my, my most productive breeding tanks because the 18 and a half inch tilapia and the large Oscar could have easily eaten any fry in that tank and they never touched them. At least I was getting massive amounts of fry in that aquarium. The African cichlids left them alone. They left the African cichlids alone. So are the peacock cichlids. So it, it just worked out really well. That tank, I eventually lost both those larger fish, the Oscar and the tilapia. The, they're still 
Peacock Cichlids are still OBs, Dragon Bloods, and Red Empress in that tank. They're getting on the older side now. But since that time, I've added, and this is going to blow some of your minds away. I'm not saying do this. In fact, I'm saying don't do this because most of the time it's not going to work. But the order in which I added them and the numbers in which I added work just fine. So now in that tank, there are some Rainbow Cichlids. Those are pretty mellow fish. They fit in just fine. I had some Thrichthys Makula Pinus. I had a group that I had to put in there. They fit in just fine. They they all kind of found their spot within the aquarium and then just kind of stuck to themselves. I've got Brichardi because I emptied out my 37-gallon breeding tank. I sold off all of the fry. I kept one sweet male that wound up in this Imbuna tank over here, but then I wound up with a few more Bruchardi. I'm like, what am I going to do with these things? I had already broken the tank down. So I chucked them in that 125. Now they've got a little spot. So it's one of those weird tanks where if you saw it, you'd be like, what? This guy doesn't have a clue on how to keep fish. And yet they're all fine. There's no fin nipping. Nobody's chasing each other around. They all have like these groups where they're, like I said, they're pretty much just stick to one another. Oh, and then I had the silver dollars and I'm like, what am I going to do with these silver dollars? I, they're, first of all, they're this big and they are, when they're that big, they don't travel well. So it wasn't like I was going to bag. First of all, I didn't even have bags big enough for these silver dollars. So I'm like, if I bring them to the swaps, I'm going to have to get some really large bags. They're not going to travel well. They're going to stress out. Where am I going to put these things? I'm like, you know, let me chuck them in that bottom 125 and see how that works. And they worked out fine. So they, the cichlids ignore the non-cichlids and the silver dollars just kind of stick to themselves. So it's a weird, weird, weird tank to be sure. But it has worked. And so that is my series of very strange combinations. Probably the other one outside of that aquarium is I had, I, we were talking about mystery snails and, and the invertebrates tonight. And I said, I don't generally trust cichlids around snails or shrimp. And that is true. But we had our mist, that one tank that I showed you, the mystery snail breeding tank was right above our Neolamprologus simless shell dweller breeding tank. And what happened was I think when Eli was gravel vacking or, or, or doing a water change on the mystery snail tank, he must have kind of sucked up a couple of mystery snails that got in the the um, the gravel back and then when he put the hose in the bottom tank they came out those snails were huge they were like this big and the simless never touched them eventually the snails just died of old age and i thought for sure when i saw them in there i was like i should get those out of there now keep in mind i had hundreds of them in the tank above i'm like you know what they don't seem to be touching them let me just see what happens and they were in there for a long time no issues it was crazy Madison Jason is a bad influence. Again, I want to be clear. I'm not saying do any of these things. Just, it's what I did. Mr. Fish, silver dollars are literally dollar store discs. You know, so before, silver dollars used to be so common when I was a kid growing up. They would be everywhere. And I don't see them as much. And I don't know why, but I got a group of them. Well, I know why, because I think they're cool. But I got a group of them, but I forgot just how skittish they are and I mean, they're bouncing off of things. You know, the, the ideal situation for them is give them some structure, get, but also some open swimming space. Don't put a fish in there. They're going to chase them around because they're going to get really stressed out. Keep them in a large group, which also means you need a large tank. That's why I had them in a 125, and that's why they went to a 125 because they do need their space. They get large, and they can be very, very skittish and very active and very fast swimmers. They eat just about every green thing. So... Uh, they'll eat duckweed. So if you've got a duckweed problem, they will definitely eat that. They'll eat all types of green plants. They do eat snails. They love snails. And especially when I had the silver dollars in our, in our 150, silver dollars, ballast sharks, tinfoil barbs, love snails. We used to have a big time. Like if you look at our older videos, there were some tanks that had massive amounts of ram's horn snails and pest snails. And people would be like, man, that's a lot of snails. I would take them out by the net full, big, huge clumps and chuck them in that 150. And the first fish that would go for them weren't the cichlids it was the it was the silver dollars the tinfoil barbs and the ballast sharks loved eating the snails so and i still t even with the tanks here if i've got some pond snails i'll throw them in that tank every once in a while let them have a snack Luis says really want a sorority tank better tank but the males are so much prettier lols so i'll deal with one yeah and the other thing too the sororities are a little bit hard to deal with i a lot of people you know, some people have it work just fine. I did the sorority, the beta sorority video, and I I don't consider myself a beta expert. That's why I talked to beta experts when I before I did that video. And the way that they've had success is keeping beta sororities and large tanks really overstocked, like you would do with an Imbuna tank. And they were stocking almost 
at a ratio of one betta per one or two gallons. So if they had a 55 gallon tank, they might have 50 bettas, female bettas in that tank. And they said that worked. Obviously, you've got a lot of water changes. People can make a very, valued arg a very, a very valid argument that that's not the way bettas should be kept. And that could be somewhat stressful. I understand that argument. Uh, but for betta sororities, if you don't want the dominant female slowly picking off all the other ones, usually it's a it's a lot of bettas in a large tank. So yeah, it's usually just better to have the either one female or one male and enjoy that. Cody, thank you very much for the super chat. What is a dream tank you would love to have someday? My dream tank is a six foot tank with sunset rainbows, glass cats, and cherry barbs. I personally think that would be a beautiful tank and I agree with you, that would be an awesome tank. Some of that is what we've got going on in this 125. We have seven glass cats, a bunch of different types of rainbow fish in there. We don't have any cherry barbs, but we've got the geophagus in there. And what else is in that tank? Oh, the snakeskin barbs, which are kind of a very similar color to the cherry barbs. But dream tank, if I had to pick one, it would probably be a really long tank. So something, I don't know, maybe 8, 10, 12 feet long. Not super tall, maybe only a couple feet tall and maybe two to three feet wide. A lot of driftwood, a lot of rocks. It would probably be more of a South American themed tank. Most likely I would do something very similar to what I did in this 125 right here. It would be a really large nano tank, but I probably, because it would be such a large tank, there'd be probably five, six, seven different types of epistogramma, groups of epistogramma in there. Um, but a lot of small nanofish, big time schooling, uh, probably some honey grommies in there as well. Uh, just kind of picking through things. I, I would probably do something like that. Just a lot of visual interest. A lot, I like tanks where you can look at them and no matter where you look, there's something going on. So I know like Whip, you love the big fish and that, that's one of the things that you really like is to have those larger fish and that's cool too. I've done that as well. But right now, I just I like to look at tanks, and I think it brings me back to my childhood, where you could you could kind of imagine where you've got this tank, and you look over in this corner, and there's something a little thing going on with certain types of fish, and you look over at the other side of the tank, and there's other things happening. To to see that in a really large scale to me is what is most interesting when you've got a lot of structure and you've got a lot of different types of fish, but they're kept properly in the proper groups, and you look at one side and like, oh my gosh, there's a group of uh, cockatoides epistogramma and there's there's a pair over there and they're breeding they've got fry but then you go over to the other side of the tank or in the middle and you've got some borelii and who knows maybe you've got some angel fish that are in midwater and they're doing their own thing and you're watching all these different types of fish schooling together but holy cow there is your big giant group of adult you know adelphi quarries or something and they're doing their own thing that's what i i really enjoy that kind of a that kind of a thing Robert says, I would love to have a three gallon long. I want to set it up on my toolbox at work. Three gallon, the bookshelf tanks are really cool. And I think that they are probably more popular now than they've ever been. But I was surprised how long it took for them to become popular because we had them for years ago. And I was like, wow, why aren't they selling these things at pet stores? And you finally started to see a lot more a lot more pet stores carrying these tanks like at Aqua Shell now they sell them in kits. Uh, it's uh, Lifeguard Aquatics is where we got a lot of our, so in the old YouTube studio, we had those four Lifeguard Aquatics tanks, the cube tanks, but they also sent us a bunch of bookshelf tanks. We had the, let's see, 2.3 gallon, the three and a half. They have a six gallon, a nine gallon, a 12 gallon long. By the time you get to the nine and the 12 gallon, you're looking at tanks that are close to three feet long. That 12 long was just under three feet, maybe 32 inches. Uh, Joanna's got a 22 long that we have had forever still in the box that she is going to be, oops, didn't mean to bump the mic there, sorry. But she's going to be setting that up in her new, and she didn't really even mention it, but we've done a lot of work, believe it or not, because the gallery, the tanks are done. We moved our attention up to what is going to wind up being her fish lounge. Uh, so now we're going to have a fish room over there fish gallery behind me and then her area is going to be like more of like a fish lounge it's got a, it's going to have a really cool kind of feel to it and she's got a 22 gallon long up there that she's getting ready to set up but it's a it's a bookshelf tank and that 22 gallon long is 36 inches long so normally with the standard size tanks a three foot tank if you want a three foot tank usually it's going to be a 40 breeder but this is a tank that i believe is only 12 feet tall 12 feet wide but it's it's three feet long so 
bookshelf tanks are really cool. If there's any challenge to those aquariums, it's one, if you are planning to use a lid, which most people are, that can be very tough. And plus they're rimless, so the lids don't necessarily look great. When we were making lids, we'd make them out of the polycarbonate, cut them to size, but it was really, okay, here's a lid so fish don't jump out, limit evaporation, but that's not a great look. And the other thing is filtration. So it wasn't a big deal for us when we had all those bookshelf tanks down here because we had air going throughout both sides. Like I took all the air down on this side. For those of you who watch the channel for a while, remember we had all the PVC going all around the perimeter of this room because we needed it. But then the bookshelf tanks, when they were set up, it wasn't a big deal to filter. But now, for instance, like a six gallon or a nine gallon long becomes without sponge filters, it does become a bit of a challenge because it's such a long tank, but it's also very narrow and very low that to get that filtered and get the water moving properly. You almost want like maybe a hang on back filter on one side and then a very small wave maker on the other just to kind of keep the circulation going. All right, let's see here. Jared says, cycling a tank with another tank's water. Great question. A lot of people, I see a lot of people uh, moving water from one tank to another. The thing is when it comes to cycling on aquarium one, you've got stuff like this, right? So you got the Fritz Lime 7. If you don't have a tank already set up, this is great. This is going to add your live nitrifying bacteria. And the nice thing is you can add a small number of fish right away. So set the tank up. People ask us all the time, how are you putting fish in a brand new tank? It's not cycled. Yes, it is because we added this. And second thing is it's not the tank water that contains the beneficial bacteria. So the beneficial bacteria are connected to surfaces. So what you'd want to do when you set up that new aquarium is move used filter media from your existing aquarium to the new filter. That's where you're getting your beneficial bacteria from. You don't need the water. In fact, the water would do nothing but harm the new fish because there's nothing good in the water. Uh, it's, there's only bad things, right? So you've only got nitrate in there and nitrate, ideally it would be zero in an unplanted tank. But so the water is not necessary, but the beneficial bacteria from the filter media is, I know a lot of people, uh, We'll just take that filter media too and they can just squeeze all that stuff in the i mean it looks like garbage like brand new tank and i'm squeezing all this stuff out of the media into my aquarium just because some of that will wind up on the surfaces of the tank itself which is a good thing but definitely used filter media that has been in the tank i like to have it in that tank for at least four to six weeks in the existing tank before i move it over Chris says, are the clubs the only way to get just one sheet of polycarbonate? I have gotten the polycarbonate two different ways. One is through Amazon. So uh, you can go to Amazon and I, I don't know if you can order just one sheet. Back when I was ordering it, it would come in ready ship packages. And I think, I wanna say it was like two feet by four feet or two feet by six feet. I don't remember the exact dimensions, but it, it usually come, you're right, like in a maybe three, two by four sheets and that would, that's what would ship. I believe that really when you order it on Amazon, what's happening is it's just Greenhouse Mega Store Direct selling through Amazon and shipping from their warehouse. I, I'm pretty sure that's what's happening, although I'm not 100% sure. But there's, there's, again, there's two avenues. One is going to Amazon. And I say that because I think you might be able to order just a single sheet. If you type in, you know, polycarbonate greenhouse siding, that's what we're talking about here is for lids. If you do that, there's two different sizes. There's a six millimeter and an eight millimeter. I think it's six and eight. I used the six for a while. It was no, it's, it's, it's thinner. And so it starts to bow out a little bit. Uh, the eight mil, I think it's the eight mil is the thicker one where it's pretty much just as thick as the rim of most rimmed tanks worked out perfectly. So I definitely prefer the thicker greenhouse siding for lids. Both of them you can cut. I used to use a jigsaw, but you could, if you really wanted to, you could use scissors, you could use an X-Acto knife, but it's good stuff. So for those odd tanks where you're like, man, I've got a corner unit or I've got a, some weird bow front and I don't have a lid and I want one, the polycarbonate greenhouse siding is the way to go. You can get it on Amazon, greenhouse mega store, I think .com is the other place to get that. All right. Me, oh, my gosh. Demars, thank you very much. He just gifted five more prime timers. Thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Noel says, I'm having some input overload. Got behind, so I'm listening to 
J at one and a half times speed, but following real time visuals on a different computer while I type chat that doesn't match what I'm hearing. I'm glad I'm not the only one that has those kinds of issues because I watch, I'll watch various live streams on all kinds of different topics. You know what's weird? I am, Joanna was looking at me the other day. She's like, what are you listening to? Why are they talking so fast? I do this all the time. I listen to all my videos on one and a half times speed, every single one, and at least one and a half times speed, because then I can watch. The, I have actually found, and I, I'm guilty of this myself. So if I need to watch one of my own videos just to see, okay, did it come through all right? Is, you know, it's just kind of double checking once it actually uploads to YouTube. I'll watch myself on one and a half times because I'm like, I talk too slow. And I'm like, Psh -ch -ch. and I know I don't because I've had a lot of people be like, dude, you talk pretty fast. I got to slow you down. Even some of my students, some will be like, oh, I have to put them on three quarter speed. Others are like, oh, I put them on, on double speed. So it just matters. Just It just depends on who the person is. But I watch all of my videos, every last one of them on one and a half times speed. It makes it go by 50% faster, in case you're doing the math. Oh, let's see here. Josh, are you going to Chicagoland Swap this weekend? Yes, I am going to the Greenwater Aquarius Society Swap website primetimeaquatics.com has already been updated with fish available for pre-order got a whole bunch of them already so we will be there hope to see you there it's going to be good because we're not going to be at any of the ones in may because of aquashella so we're going to miss the quad city we're going to miss the green water in may there is a green water in june which we should be at there's none in july because they have their summer party and then there's one in august so the swap season has definitely starting to wind down a lot uh, and it's just people have other things going on so swaps don't really don't make for most clubs they don't make a lot of sense not only that but for a lot of people who are breeding fish they need the summer months just to kind of restock get their breeding projects back up and running so they have enough fish for the swap season in the fall and in the winter 2k random says can i keep in a 10 gallon tank 12 green neons four pygmy quarries and a honey grammy yeah, I think that's that's a reasonable. I, I don't think I'd keep any more. Uh, I might shave that green neon down at least initially, maybe to eight to ten. But yeah, that that's a reasonable stocking. I wouldn't put and I, if it's not cycled, I wouldn't put them all in there at the same time, obviously. But that would be a reasonable group of fish for a ten gallon. I think that look pretty cool. You've got a lot of color variants in there too. I like it. All right, hold on. Aquazen says 1.25 is good for slow talkers. Won't name any names. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? If if you're watching my videos, would you put it? Would you be more prone to putting it on one and a half times or half time or three quarter time? For me, I think it depends on one of the what video I'm talking about. Okay, hold on a second here. I'm looking for. Broken Table says, adding a canister to that 10-gallon could give you extra gallon also. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it could, but not necessarily extra swimming space. Ooh, good one. Thank you for the super chat, Cody. Appreciate it. Rainbow Shark or Red Tail Shark and why? Okay, you have to understand, when I was a kid, these were my favorite fish. So they were right up. I love the rainbow sharks. I love the red tail sharks. If I had to pick one, this is just a personal opinion. They're both awesome. I would slightly lean towards the red tail shark because I prefer the body shape a little bit more than the rainbow shark. So the rainbow shark tends to be ever so slightly. It's a more thinner bodied fish but you could make a really strong argument that for rainbow sharks, well, now you're getting the red dorsal fin and the red tail, which is pretty awesome. Where with the red tail shark, uh, you're only getting the one red part of the body. Red tail sharks tend to get a little bit larger. I guess I've, have I had better luck with the red tail sharks long-term? I mean, when I did that species profile, that fish was like seven inches long. I probably kept more red tail sharks than rainbows throughout time. Again, I can flip a coin with these two. I love them both, but I guess I just have to go red tail shark because of the body shape, because I think they get a little bit larger. 
I tend to think they are slightly more aggressive. They're both pretty darn aggressive. They are both fish that I would keep in a semi-aggressive tank only. They're not community fish. They're not fish I'd be keeping in with, oh, let's just put them in with my guppies and my just wonderful little tetras that are, you know, some tetras are fine, like your, your black skirt tetras, white skirt tetras, red eyes, um, Buenos Aires, that's a great mix. But if I just had like the mellow tetras or rasboras or guppies or endlers or something like that, no. I have the best luck with both of those fish either in African cichlid tanks or in the semi-aggressive, not, well, mostly unaggressive tanks like with electric blue acara and, and uh, severums, uh, that kind of thing. Firemouth cichlids, those smaller types, that has always worked out really well for me. I'd like to get one of those at some point back in the fish room somewhere. The problem right now is the actual fish room, so many of those tanks right now are set aside for quarantine. And at some point, we're going to get back to our original plan. And the original plan and on that side was all of the top tanks were going to be for display. All right, so hopefully nicely aquascape with a really interesting, I, I don't know, just a community of fish, right? And then all the bottom row tanks were going to be for quarantine and breeding. So that's eventually what I'd like to get to. And when that happens, I could see myself winding up with either a rainbow or a red tail shark. Um, it says, I listen most info-based videos on two times. Yeah, that's just the way my brain, two times is a little rough because sometimes some people do speak pretty quick, but one and a half, I can pretty much watch any video at one and a half. Jose says, red tail sharks tend to be darker. Yes, that is true. They tend to be darker, uh, really dark blue and tail brighter, right? Where the rainbow sharks, you're getting much more of that bluish color for sure. I... I'm also kind of scarred, I think, because the last time I had a rainbow shark, it was in the 150. And at the time, I had that fish in with a Lethronops. It was a, it was a strange tank, but it, it worked. So it was a Lethronops, Red Empress, uh, the ACI cichlid. And then what else was in there? Maybe a Species 44. There was a bunch. Of, it, was, it was an interesting, mostly African cichlid tank. Well, that rainbow shark decided that it was going to rule the tank and it did for a while and it would chase all of these much larger much more aggressive typically much more aggressive cichlids around to the point where i was like that rainbow shark's gonna have to come out because he's terrorizing these other fish well at some point he must have pushed it a little too far because what as you know what cichlids will do when they really start to fight is they will lock mouths and they will whip each other around i'm pretty sure because I walked down the next day that that's what happened. And I'm, what I'm assuming happened is that cichlid tried to lock miles with the red tail shark. And the red tail shark was missing its bottom jaw. Swimming around fine. And I'm like, oh no, what is going on? What am I going to do about this? And it was the, it was the weirdest thing. It lived somehow managed to eat and it lived that way. Nothing got infected. It looked like it was just a fish without a lower part. Of, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And it lived for a, a pretty long time, just like that. It was the weirdest thing. And it still managed to eat. So I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> what is going on? Regina says, when the words come in weirdly fast, I can't adjust. Oh, yeah. You got to pick up your brain and just be like, bam. Noel says, I caught up just in time for the end. See, that's a sense of accomplishment right there. Very nice. Brent says, is a guppy okay by itself in a community tank? If not, which is the minimum number they should be kept in? They're fine. I've kept guppies by themselves many, 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 many times. Uh, they never looked heartbroken or anything like that. Acted like normal guppies doing their own thing. In fact, there will be people who are like, you know what? I don't want my guppies to breathe. So I'm going to do a male only tank, or I'm just going to keep one male with a nice little fins. And I never noticed any difference whatsoever. So if you did want to keep them in a group, highly recommend. I know the, the typical recommendation is one male for two females. I actually don't think that's enough long-term. Uh, some males can be really, really aggressive, not aggressive, but really persistent when they want to breed. So I like to do one male for like four or five females, ideally, but just keeping one is fine. Got a light, light, nice little bit of energy there. 
Michelle says in the description below this video, there are supposed to be video links. They're not there. Did I not link them? That was dumb. Okay, I will add them as soon as this is over here in a couple minutes because I had, yeah, the mystery snail one and then the shrimp one. Maybe I just put the titles in there and I forgot to put the links. That is something I could see myself doing. You know, I mean, I've done stranger things, I will admit. Let's see. Let me just go in there right now and I will confirm for you. Yeah, I put the titles in with no links. All right, I will fix that when this is done because that was silly. All right, everybody. I think now would probably be a good time to end this bad boy anyway because it's right about the hour and a half mark. And I know that some of you are tired and want to go night night. So thank you. Thank you for all the people that were here, all the great questions for our moderators holding down everything and for Damara's and all the primetime gifts and the super chats that came in. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, we will be back again, same time, same place next Wednesday. Uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to check out that video we did on Sunday about the Threadfin Rainbow, I think you will like it. And don't forget the Flip Aquatics discount code Primetime Snails. That's 20% off Mystery Snails and Nearite Snails for the rest of the week. So thanks for being here. We will see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.